It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris-based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast foreign editor, Christopher Dickey is with us. How are you, sir? Well, glad to be back, but it was nicer on the beach, really. You were on the beach. Yeah, I was. All right. Well, month of April and on the beach. Okay. That's noted. Uh, also with us, uh, Sylvia Ayuso, who's not been on the beach this week. Not yet. A Paris correspondent <laughs> for El País. Welcome to the show. Uh, welcome back as well to uh, Johanna Frenden, Paris correspondent for the Swedish daily newspaper Aftonbladet. Nice to see you. Thank you. You and, too. And uh, Victor Ballot, Paris Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. How are you? Good, thanks. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. Last month, it was a white supremacist shooting up mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Easter Sunday, a fringe group from what is a minority religion in Sri Lanka targeting another minority religion as well as uh, Western tourists, nine suicide blasts, uh, nine suicide attackers in churches and hotels, decimating families, uh, rich and poor. Uh, you know, every time something like this happens, and in this case, we're talking about more than 250 dead, Christopher Dickey, we still wonder why people do this. God, religion, faith in the afterlife, all kinds of reasons drive people to do that. We know that these particular people were not underprivileged. They were not desperate people. Yeah, it's uh, more of a 9-11 profile but that's a, but that's true rather again and than again. But that's what true. we saw with the Paris attacks. That's so often the case. Because what you've got, I mean, basically any terrorist group, but particularly these groups, it's not about uh, their own suffering. It's about the extent to which they identify with a narrative of suffering in which they can present themselves, at least in their own heads, as heroes, representing the people, the vast Muslim um, Sunni takfiri group that they see as an oppressed minority. And that's the way they justify killing almost anyone. And you see it again and again and again. Relatively well off, and they, uh, for most of the uh, of the attackers, uh, well traveled. Some uh, two were brothers from a, from a wealthy uh, uh, business uh, business right. uh, spice merchant. Uh, spice yeah. merchants. This is not the same again as as what we saw with the Paris attacks, where the, those radicalized came from a working class or. or well, working around class, a working class working, neighborhood in in in, in yeah, Brussels. Yeah, but that's again, that's exaggerated. I mean, the people who were involved in the in the Paris attacks, yes, they were from a working class or uh, less advantaged backgrounds, but they some were radicalized. Not, in but prison. they were not. But they were not suffering people. They were not people who were under the oppressive boot of some fascist regime, uh, or Christian regime, or Jewish regime, or whatever. They were people who basically. Um, we're looking for a purpose in life. And a lot of people who have money are also looking for a purpose in life. And some of those people are attracted by radical ideologies. And you, uh, one of your reporters mentioning in a story that in the uh, ISIS put out this, this video and they don't even mention Christchurch in it. They don't mention New Zealand. No, I mean, their war, their ISIS as a distinct, a little bit distinct from Al Qaeda, ISIS is at war with Christianity and with Christians. It's also, for that matter, at war with Shia Muslims, Jews, and Sunni Muslims who don't believe the way ISIS believes. ISIS is a very small, focused ideology uh, in which anybody who doesn't go along with its beliefs uh, is uh, eligible to be killed. Victor Mallon? Yeah, I mean, one weird thing about this, is, I think, is is that the Christians are a tiny minority in in Sri Lanka, uh, like the like the Muslims. So this is not like uh, a, a Muslim minority attacking the the majority or anything like that. It was much more uh, sort of narrowly focused on Westerners, I guess, in the hotels, but also on on Christians, uh, Sri Lankan Christians in the churches. I think one thing it shows is how um, extremism, Islamist extremism, is quite. Uh, prevalent in South Asia in ways that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. You know, they tend to think of the Middle East and big attacks in Western cities like London, Paris, and New York. But actually, there's a lot of trouble going on in places like the Maldives, uh, which are quite close to Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and so on. And uh, a lot of these attacks tend to, in the case of the Maldives, you know, people have gone to fight in the Middle East. Um, for ISIS, uh, and they've come back. And as a proportion of the population, it's extraordinarily 
high in the Maldives, but then the Maldives is a, is a Muslim majority country. Um, but, you know, Sri Lanka has suffered from all kinds of extremism over the years, and this is just uh, sort of an extreme prominent example of it um, on, the, on the Islamist side. I mean, we've had Buddhist extremists in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, and then we've had uh, outbreaks of all kinds of extremism in that part of the world that I think, you know, people are now sitting up and taking notice of, whether it's uh, Islamist or Hindu or Buddhist extremism. There's a lot of it about. As you know, in Myanmar, formerly Burma, you know, you had these... Uh, sort of Buddhist purges, essentially, of, of the Muslim uh, minority in the west of the country. So. India right now in the, th in the midst of its uh, six-week general election process. How, how are, are these attacks going to play? Uh, yeah, they could do, yeah. I mean, um, the, um, the, the Hindus are also a minority in Sri Lanka, but uh, the BJP, Narendra Modi, the current prime minister, they very much played on this kind of nationalist and religious Hindu card, you know, against the Muslim minority and against Pakistan, which is seen as and indeed is in some ways a hotbed of Islamist extremism. So, yeah, that could well play in, in the Indian elections, although they're kind of halfway through or more than halfway through now. All right. This Friday, authorities in Sri Lanka positively identifying inside the Shangri-La Hotel the head of the uh, fringe Muslim radical group uh, that uh, is blamed as one of the nine suicide bombers. That has infuriated the local Muslim community in uh, Mawanella, where France 24's team went. Mawanella, which remembers Zaran Hashim from the days that he spewed hate and incited to the desecration of Buddhist statues. When the video was circulating about this extremist talk that we have lodged a complaint, our local Muslim members have done enough of complaint and they have done even protest against him. They have in enough information about him, where he is, where he is going, what is coming, but they are not arresting him. And that brings us to the local context where you have a constitutional crisis right now, a president who doesn't speak to the prime minister, the defense minister who answers uh, to the president. Uh, and uh, when the prime minister on the day of the attacks tried to convene a war cabinet, uh, well, those ministers didn't even show up this Friday. The president uh, shifting the blame. I've already begun a complete restructuring of our defense units. The process from the defense ministry to the police to intelligence units has begun. Right, that's what he's saying. He's, he's, also, uh, he's also been pointing the finger at the fact that there had been uh, per changes made uh, because of, a t of the 10-year civil war that was more than a decade ago. It seems as though because of the security lapses, because of the infighting, that made Sri Lanka a soft target. It does. It also, I mean, experts say that there was a cell, there was a, they've been seeing that some of the terrorists in other, in other countries came from Sri Lanka, so there was a, a cell somehow. So it was a question of time that they would hit in their own country. And also hitting in Sri Lanka, who has been, where tourism has been exploding lately, well, exploding is not a good word for that, but uh, it hits also much farther, it goes much farther the impact than just Sri Lanka, it goes also to Europe, many Europeans. We've seen a lot of victims came from many European countries, so it's another way of targeting as well the maybe more topical countries or places like, it's not like hitting maybe Paris, but it goes quite similarly. Yeah, because that's the question, is, is there's the local context, but is this a story just about globalization? Because obviously, they had to, the authorities there strongly suspect that they did have outside help, the fact that these attacks were so well coordinated. Well, the terrorism is about that. It's uh, doing a lot of, having a lot of impact with a little, few resources. I mean, these were very well planned uh, attacks. Apparently, this, they've been planning it for years, but it doesn't mean that it w was a, a dozen person who blew him themselves. It's not like a war, but they have a huge impact. And that's, it's been terrorism everywhere, even homegrown terrorism like we've been living, we've had in Spain. Yeah, we, 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 were, we were told when uh, the last ISIS bastions fell in eastern Syria that we'd be entering a new phase. But after the events uh, in Sri Lanka, Johanna Frenzen, it feels like the old it feels it doesn't feel any different from what we've witnessed before no it doesn't it feels exactly the same i mean it did take some time before isis actually came up and and uh, took responsibility or claimed that this uh, attack but apart from that it looks very much like before as we've seen in in france in you know 
almost any uh, European city in Stockholm a, a couple of years ago. We had the same, uh, uh, you know, we had the same kind of attack. It was a sole um, terrorist, but uh, obviously, you know, inspired by uh, ISIS. It's, I think, as long as uh, the the situation is, you know, what it still is, the, the war isn't really over. You know, it's it. We, you could say it's over, but it's. ISIS is still going to claim and, and, and take responsibility for attacks like this. And more importantly, people who carry out attacks are, you know, still quite, um, I think, prone to, to, to call on ISIS to, to give it a bigger meaning. You know, we, that's what you were, you were saying before. It's also a way of giving your act a bigger meaning and a global uh, meaning uh, as well, because it becomes more terrifying this way. But it does bring us back, Christopher Dickey, to the fact that, there, that this is a, a throwback, isn't it? The fact that you have these nine coordinated attacks, uh, su suicide attackers, hitting seven uh, different targets uh, at the same time, whereas we've gotten more used to low-grade attacks, people really low, run... Really low, guys running over people with trucks. With like trucks, in, exactly. Like in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but there is a long, long history of coordinated attacks. I mean, you can go back to Dar es Salaam but and it's the first time in, in 1998. While. It is the first time in a while. But I was in New York when this happened, and one of the things that we were looking at uh, was how easy this is to do now with cell phones. It's very easy to communicate. A bunch of people, particularly with encrypted cell phone communications, you can easily say, where are you? Are you in front of the church? Yes, I'm in front of the church. Are, are we all in front of the church? Okay, let's go in. That kind of thing is much more easily done. The big technical question in, in Sri Lanka is where the hell did they get all those explosives? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, this is a country that had a three-decade-long uh, war, guerrilla war, by what are, what are called the uh, Tamil Tigers. It ended in 2009. Maybe there's a lot of stuff left over. I don't know. But coordinating attacks is not very difficult anymore. Your Honor, friend, and one final point on this, uh, the closing down of the, uh, a lot of the Internet, uh, by social media, by the authorities in the wake of the attack. Uh, your thoughts on that? It's, I think it's complicated issue it feels uh, I mean you would probably associate that with any uh, authoritarian state uh, I'm not in a position to say whether it was a good decision you know in terms of security uh, I think it's it's quite obvious though that that it's you know this country was not prepared to no country is prepared for this kind of attack but there was no security to to handle it there's obviously no you know communication within the political establishment either and people start blaming each other for different things so I, as a whole i would probably conclude that the country itself and the, and the the government didn't know doesn't know how to how to handle the situation this was one way of controlling it the best they could i guess i would just add overall complacency is a huge problem here uh, ISIS is going to attack the softest targets it can find, where it can organize spectacular attacks. Sri Lanka fit that uh, bill perfectly. And one of the problems, as a friend of mine who was at a conference, counter-terror conference in February pointed out, is that nobody really was talking about Islamic uh, terrorism as a threat there. Everybody was still congratulating themselves on eliminating the Tamil Tigers 10 years ago. So there was this kind of complacency, mm. and that's the most dangerous, in many ways, the most dangerous thing of all. All right, we're going to turn our attention to Europe. It's the end of the campaign in Spain, third general election in four years. And uh, at the first of a pair of candidates' debates last uh, Monday, Sylvia, you, so you can see the images here, uh, you've got um, the obvious when you look at the pictures. Well, there's no women. Yes. <laughs> but there's something else to remark upon. There's four of them. Uh, not five. And that fifth, of course, would be the far-right Vox Party, not yet represented in Parliament, but which should be, perhaps. On it some, will. will be. It will be. The, the question is how, how, much, uh, see, how many seats they're going to get. Uh, they are, they're saying around 10, they're going to get at around 10 percent vote. Many fear that it's going to be much more. We're facing a new reality in Spain, which is uh, usually it was first, I mean, first is uh, the, begin, the, the, the appearance of the ultra right, which wasn't there until recently. And then also for the first time, which is also very interesting, because usually the, the division was among the left parties, but now it's also the right. The right is also fighting for, for a lot of votes, because it's the ultra right, it's the Partido Popular, which was the traditional right, and Ciudadanos, who's 
who presented itself in the beginning like center right, and it's gone way farther to the right now. And they're disputing the same number of, uh, I mean, of, of, of votes, and so that's what what makes everything a bit more complicated this time and interesting as well. When we um, did a debate on this in this very studio on Tuesday. We would try to talk about other issues, but in inevitably, it seemed to always come back to Catalonia. Of course, that's the big difference. Since the last time you had a general election, you've had this uh, banned referendum in, in October of 2017. It's that, and that's also the Catalonia problem. It's also the reason why Vox is so strong right now. It's been a reaction. It's been a reaction that's been uh, a reaction of a part of Spanish people, Spaniards, that think that, that they're being questioned of their Spanish identity, which is a way of saying, well, I mean, the, the, the patriotism, they've, they've, they've opened up this, this debate on Catalonia, it's opened up, it's, it's affected not only Catalonia, it's also affected the whole rest of Spain, who saw how they were being questioned, I mean, saying, like saying it's a fascist state, it's a ultra right, it's not a democratic state. So it opened up the doors to the defense, even the leftist party, even the Partido Socialista came out, came out, presented itself with a big Spanish flag, which is something unseen. I mean, mm. the, the symbols in Spain, the, the flags, was something almost a taboo after 40 years of, of dictature. And and now it's very nor it's normalized, and this normalization of this patriotism of Spain, 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 which was really, really a taboo, has opened up the doors to these extreme voices. Yeah, except when uh, La Roja, the national team, wins at football, Spain was never that big on on <laughs> flag waving. Since that Catalonia crisis, times have changed, and now you've got Vox, who who by the way include as well in their slate of candidates. Uh, two retired Franco-era generals. Your thoughts on that, Victor Mallon? Well, I, I think it comes back to this 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 sort of problem or conundrum of having all these parties contesting. You know, what what you've seen is the sort of breakdown of the old right-left uh, solid divisions. You know, you had the socialists on the left, and you had the Partido Popular, which was the kind of inheritors of Franco <laughs> on the right, and everyone knew where they were, and that's the way it was. And you had the sort of the regional nationalists, the Basques and the Catalans on the side. But now, you know, the Catalans are, are holding essentially the balance of power. It looks like in the in in the next parliament. Obviously, it depends what happens when the voting when the voting actually happens. But uh, so you've got this, and this is happening all over Europe. This is not just in Spain. Mm. Um, yes, it, it is the first time that Spain has had this kind of very prominent ultra-right party since uh, since Franco's death. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got the same sort of breakdown of in France, where we are now. You've got this kind of, uh, these new parties in, in, in the case of France, it's Macron's party that's come in and kind of essentially destroyed the traditional right and the traditional left. So you have this kind of fragmentation and you have extremism as well, which, mm -hmm. which was always kind of buried, I think. You know, the right-wing extremism was, was sort of hidden and constrained by being in the Partido Popular, the, the, the right-wing party. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of burst out with a kind of splinter movement, which mm -hmm. became Vox in Andalusia. Uh, and you know maybe we'll see ultra left parties. In fact, the you know Casado, the the head of the PP, was I think sort of going back to the civil war and, and accusing the left of mm. being the sort of popular front, like in the days of the Spanish civil war. All right, we're we're going to pick up on these points. We're going to take a very quick break. Uh, stay with us. You're watching the world this week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Christopher Dickey, Daily Beast foreign editor is with us, as is Silvia Ayuso, Paris correspondent for uh, Spanish daily newspaper El País, uh, Johanna Frenden, Paris correspondent for Swedish daily newspaper Afton Blattet, and Victor Mallet, Paris bureau chief for UK a daily newspaper, The Financial Times. International. International yeah, say, now, yeah. you say, yeah. yes, of course. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, we were talking before the break about the elections in Spain, yet another country where the far right is poised to enter parliament. And uh, it's not just Franco-era generals that will be on the ballot. Vox and the conservative PP party fielding bullfighters and widows of bullfighters. There's a feeling of anxiety that runs through your whole body that can't be stopped. It's a bit like when I was in the ring. It took some time, but as soon as I got near the ring, I felt like I was facing the unexpected. Now, there's a story, Silvia Ayuso. Uh, uh, the, the bullfighters 
both the PP and Vox have bullfighter candidates. It seems to be an answer to the the left fielding animal welfare campaign uh, candidates. Yeah, I mean, the Toros, the bullfight, has been a divisive uh, thing for many years, uh, mostly on the left. Uh, they've been for banning it because, and the, mostly the conservatives say it's a tradition, it's a culture, even if it's it's in the cultural pages of the newspaper, it's not on, or sometimes on the sports, but it's taken as a culture thing. Um, it's, 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 but it's also a bit, uh, I mean, I have to say, uh, Macron, I think she, he had a candidate for parliament who was also in Nima, a Spanish, uh, well, or Spanish origin bullfighter, a woman, uh, that didn't get to the legislative, but they had a candidate as well. But it's uh, it's a bit like this, this cliché, so this stereotypes from Spain, they play, they playing this who is the most Spanish one, the most patriotic. And it's a... Uh, well, it's, and it's, it's new is what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's like another kind of populism. It's like it's like throwing out simple phrases and you show images of Spain, military, <clears throat> toreros. Uh, mm, well, uh, it it seems to work for some people. Jo- Johanna Frinden, you're the, the, uh, the fact that um, people are playing to their national stereotypes more than before in elections across Europe. And by the way, we're one month from today, there'll be European elections. Mm. Your thoughts on that? Uh, I think in some countries it's a bit more natural, if I may use that term. In Spain, having having lived in Spain, it's it's a complete, like you said, it, those are cliches, stereotypes. Uh, having lived and traveled around Spain, you know there's th- this doesn't exist. I mean, this is a, a made up, this is tourist postcard that you send home to Sweden, right? You know, the bullfighter or the flamenco dancer. But speaking to Spanish people all over Spain, you know, there are different dialects, different languages, very different cultural uh, identities. So it seems very much like the cliche of Spain that never really existed, or at least... So why is it happening? Because there is obviously, a, a, a you know, an, an ID or a search for a national identity all over Europe. And I think Spain is no real uh, exception to this. I think that what people really care about, I mean, you know, in polls is the unemployment, uh, the um, the problems with bur- corruption, you know, in the bur- bureaucracy, and a lot of um, doubt, you know, in the political system. So this is, this is more of like the picture you paint, you know, to get uh, attention. But it's, I think very few Spanish people actually care about you know, the bullfighting issue, to be so honest. So 10 years ago, we had the financial crisis. It hit Spain particularly hard, Christopher Dickey. And today we've got the flag waving that Silvia's described. Yeah, but how is it that we're having this conversation without even mentioning the question of migrants, which is a huge problem, a growing problem uh, in Spain? You've got Ceuta and Melilla are basically the back door to the European Union. And Those two dependencies on... On, on Morocco's on, coast. Yeah. And uh, and they have huge barriers around them, and yet people break through those barriers all the time. Last August, the police were being attacked with quicklime and acid. There a lot of ugly stuff goes on there. It all gets into the press. It makes people afraid. And in fact, migration into Europe now, there's more of it coming through Ceuta and Melilla than is going across the Mediterranean from Libya. May I? You're absolutely right, but this is not that a big issue in these elections, and it's well, more. But I would note, I would note that the head of Vox is yes. saying, yes. "A la, yes, the, a la Donald Trump, we need better walls." Yes, yes, of course, and he's playing all those cards. But it's not the main issue. It's an issue of identity that's been put in question. But migrants you- challenge identity. The the response. What is, it, what is the response of all over Europe? What are these fascist and right-wing parties calling themselves? They're calling themselves identitarian. Yes. Why is that? Because you're, when you feel threatened by migration, what you say is, we want this place for us. We are here. These are our traditions. We don't want foreigners. We especially don't want people with dark skins and people of Muslim of all, the, of all the countries in Europe, Spain is, in a way, the least susceptible to it that. Has it's been, true it that has been. It has been, but that's it's, why and it's Vox only, is so and interesting. And it's only one of the issues for Vox, right? I think, yeah. is that right? I mean, I, my understanding is that Vox does raise that issue, and it's one of the reasons it became prominent. But there are plenty of other issues, conservative issues. There are always lots abortion of Abortion and, yeah. and, and, you know, Catholicism and the, the identity thing. They're not all about migration. Yeah. And, in fact, the Spanish are extraordinarily tolerant of migration, which is they actually not... They always have been. 
said that. A par- big part of migration are from Latin America, which are mostly Catholics and and have very similar traditions. So immigration. Nobody's talking about is, building a wall to keep out the Catholics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it it is a problem, but it's not. The big problem. It's not why Vox is being voted, at least yet. I mean, this is... Where, where, there are where other was Vox that born? Going, what, where, did, where does Vox come from? Andalusia? No, 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 no. Vox, no, 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 we just heard that. Yeah, no, Vox won the very first times in Andalusia, but mm-hmm. Santiago Abascal comes from the uh, from Basque country. Mm-hmm. He grew up over there. So they there won in the, Andalusia. He, that's was a reaction reputation. also mostly on ETA, on the terrorists of ETA. Mm-hmm. He worked for years for the Popular Party, and at some point it wasn't extremist enough. And Vox search when Catalonia issue search. So Vox is a product of the Catalonian discussion. It's not a product of mm-hmm. immigration. Okay. Mm. Happy to hear that, I guess. When the yellow yes. v- when the yellow vest movement erupted, France's president went on a listening tour. On Thursday, at his first press conference after nearly two years in office, Emmanuel Macron reflected on what he called, quote, the art of being French after those three months of town hall style meetings. Alors, face à toutes. Mentions convinced me of one thing in particular. We are, above everything else, children of the Enlightenment. And it's from these debates, these deliberations, this capacity to contradict one another whilst respecting each other, that the right solutions can emerge for the country. All right, let's turn to the new guy to get his reaction. You're, you're, you're new as Paris bureau chief. Yeah, Paris. That, that's right. Well, what I mean, did you think of Emmanuel Macron talking about children of the Enlightenment? Well, I thought this was classic sort of French identity politics. You know, exactly those phrases. You know, the art of being French. Uh, and, and when you look at when you translate it into English, it comes out as complete fluff. You think, you know, what is this nonsense? But I think it does have some appeal to the French. Probably not quite as much as as Macron would like. But this was very much a speech and a press conference that was directed almost entirely at a French domestic audience. And this was not about Europe, which some of his previous interventions have been. This was absolutely about getting, you know, trying to undermine the Gilets Jaunes, trying to get support for his mm-hmm. future reforms, trying to win the European elections for his party. This was not about, uh, you know, not about Europe in the sense of European and, and policy. It was really about domestic policy. What did you make of the, the regalian setting of the Elysee presidential palace and the... Well, he's not the first, is he? I mean, no. I think uh, it was quite funny, actually, watching all his ministers who sort of sat there without saying a word for two and a half hours on these very uncomfortable chairs. And, and one of my colleagues tweeted a picture of them all looking sort of rather awkward and Castanier the interior minister this morning um, you know was saying on the radio well the chairs were, were very uh, very uncomfortable and of course we were all listening and I was taking notes you know I mean it, it's a very odd situation where you have this kind of this very sort of imperial type of president who sits there with his cabinet saying nothing for two and a half hours while people throw questions at him I mean it, it wouldn't work in Britain and I don't think it would work in America but uh, it clearly has worked to some extent in France. I mean, I, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the voters think about this performance and, and the kind of the opinion polls are, are, are pretty mixed. You know, I think basically on the policies they like, they, they approve of what he said and on the policies they don't, they disapprove. But they don't seem to mind the performance. They don't seem to mind the stuff about children of the Enlightenment. Johanna Freinden? Well, I think maybe the fact that he tries so hard right now is, you know, the French might kind of like that. I think that, you know, in, in general, the French feel that, okay, he's, he's really trying, actually. He's, he's you know, uh, taking back things that he said during or before the, the Yellow Vest uh, movement or the, the outburst of that movement, anyway, and uh, trying to um, come across as a bit more, you know, humane or listening. Uh, and the, the grand debate, I think, did have an impact on, on uh, the image of uh, Macron, actually. He did become a bit, you know, more popular. He went up in the polls. He did, exactly. Uh, so this is dialogue, and, uh, you know, that's what people claim to want. Then do the Yellow Vest really want it? And are they happy with what he, you know, the message that he uh, came up with last night? Not much 
happened. I mean, not much reform was was presented. So I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference uh, towards the Yellow Vest movement. I think but, he's yeah. lost them. I think he has to, lost them. To be them. fair to Macron, nothing he could have said would have pleased the remaining people who exactly. are still in the Gilets Jaunes. Exactly, because yeah, the, the yeah. crack between the two yeah. are, is yeah. too big, yeah. you know, and it has mm. been yeah. since for, for six months. What you were mentioning before, did he t really talk to the uh, Gilets Jaunes, to the, the Yellow Vest, or did he talk to his electorate, to the people who usually yeah. elected mm. him? Because it seemed, yes, some measures, it's what they were claiming, like uh, tax, uh, less taxes, but it sometimes was like people, I mean, his electorate base, uh, retired people that might go to the right in the next European elections. Yeah, he said a lot of right-wing stuff in that, yes. in that press conference. Uh, Macron seemed to be courting far-right voters when he talked about a carbon tax at Europe's borders and a smaller Schengen area to police border controls. I don't want there to be states in the Schengen area that tell you, I'm with you for the freedom of movements, but not when it comes to spreading the burden. What does all this mean? Neither do I want people who don't want to hold on to the common border and are too indulgent. We must reshuffle it. So that's obviously a dig at uh, Italy, isn't it? I mean, it's what I gathered, although he didn't say the word Italy in that. Yeah, it's also when Castaner, after the meeting of the interior seven, minister, interior minister uh, said something against the NGOs that sounded very like Salvini, and he was very criticized for that because Salvini had just left the room. So, but I was today, from, I was speaking to some experts, and they were saying, well, the thing is. Looking ahead to the European elections, uh, Macron's fears might be that he loses voters from the right, but not really from the left, because the left hasn't recomposed itself yet enough to propose a, a real alternative. That's what some say. Whereas the right, there, there, is, there are some other alternatives in this case that might go back to where they came, the voters. So maybe that's why he also went more to the right. Kostelegi? You know, look, he wanted to stake out a center or center-right position all along. That was what he ran on. That's what he's trying to do now. Is he moving a little bit to the right? Yes. And on what issue? Oh, gosh, immigration. What is the question with immigration? The question with immigration is how the hell do you deal with masses of people who want to come into Europe and Europe can't accommodate them anymore? And you don't have to, you can be very liberal and still recognize that that is an issue that has to be addressed. And that's exactly what he's saying. It has to be addressed. You can't have a Schengen uh, agreement that covers so many different countries, and yet only some countries bear responsibility for the people who come in. It, mm. it gets very, very complicated. And also, the borders are, have become incredibly porous. So you have to do something to, to regulate immigration. That doesn't mean you're a racist. It doesn't mean that you're a right-winger. It doesn't mean you're a fascist. But it does mean that the fascists and the right-wingers will take advantage of that issue if you don't address it, and that's what he's trying to Absolutely. do. I couldn't agree more. He's definitely trying to get the, you know, Rassemblement National, Marine Le Pen's votes with that issue. In fact, he's been doing it for some time. This is not entirely new. I mean, clearly it was a speech directed at getting right-wing votes. But in his letter to the French people, which I think was in January, he, he talked about, he suggested the idea of immigration quotas, you know, which is the first time I think he's mm. talked about that. So it's definitely a path that he's on, yeah. A path that he's on. One of the big criticisms was he didn't talk enough about the environment. Speaking of which, They've now packed up their tents and rolled up their sleeping bags in London for 11 days. Extinction Rebellion activists taking over Marble Arch, marching on Parliament, blocking bridges, and even, in one instance, super gluing themselves to an <laughs> underground train carriage at Canary Wharf Station. And so further action must be taken. We must act now. Huh. By the way, uh, there's a postscriptum to that story. The old man you saw in those images, um, well, he, he's been arrested and held for, for, that, for that train stunt. Um, hey, for once, we're not talking about Brexit, are we? Thank God, yeah. <laughs> I actually walked through Marble Arch the other day, and it was, I mean, I have to say, it was remarkably good humoured, you know, compared to some of the Gilets Jaunes stuff. It was actually quite a relief. to, And there were sort of policemen walking around looking very friendly and relaxed, and, you know, eventually the whole thing was, was, uh, was resolved. But, you know, I think... 
obviously there was some sort of intolerance of, of these people because people wanted to go to work, they wanted to go to their jobs, the shops wanted to sell stuff on Saturdays and they were finding it difficult because the roads were closed. But it really was, I mean, to say it was a sort of festival atmosphere is completely true. You know, it was really like that, especially when, when the weather was nice. And, and the, the question is whether or not the message that those people put out, which is that the climate is a real emergency that we have to address now, whether that's been heard or not. I think there's quite a lot of serious middle class sympathy for this point of view, you know, which is why a lot of the people who took part were not sort of dreadlocked teenagers, although some of them were. They were kind of middle class people who kind of left their jobs and said, you know, I've never been arrested before. I never thought I would be arrested. Um, but, you know, they really want to do something that they feel is really, really serious and, and really urgent. And governments are not paying attention. The British government, because it's obsessed by Brexit and uh, other governments for other reasons. And they, and they got the attention. Uh, uh, they did, but the question is, will anything actually mm. happen as a result of this? Will will policies be changed? I mean, I, the jury's still out on that. Yeah, because uh, w one week ago, uh, we saw in Paris last Friday, uh, there was, it got a little bit testy uh, with uh, the protesters, um, the sort of equivalent of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, they were at the business district. Uh, there was some, a little bit of tear gas. And... Some of them said, you know, because of the Yellow Vest movement, we realize if we don't make up a bit of a stink, no one's going to pay attention. Mm. I think this is probably just the start of a uh, movement or different movements uh, around the globe, probably, that will get, that might get more violent if nothing happens. You know, if there is no response to, to what they are asking, because they now have lots of, you know, people, especially in the, in the Western world, behind them. Uh, and I think we, we're making a mistake thinking that, um, you know, people couldn't get to work, or, you know, they, they cause damage. Not That's somehow what the, the you know, the, the objective, that's the goal of this kind mm. of uh, activism. Because if nothing happens, if it's business as usual, as the mayor of London said, no, nobody's going to uh, really pay attention. You know, it's, not, it's when it starts costing too much, like the yellow vests, that you will have to take political measures uh, because it then becomes a crisis. Yeah. And, and well, but I mean, the yellow vest started essentially, you could say, as an anti environmental movement. Mm. They started because they didn't want to pay the carbon tax. And the whole question was they were felt they were being unfairly hit by it. Well, exactly. Which but is, everybody feels they're being unfairly hit when they have to pay more money. Nobody wants to pay for the environment. That's the problem. That's why it's always people should do something about the environment. When it no comes means. to what they're going to do yeah. and who is going to pay for it, all of this tar starts to fall apart. But it's very noticeable the recent Gilets Jaunes marches in Paris have become quite left-wing. You know, they, initially some of them were quite right-wing, some of the demonstrators, and now they're quite, they're quite left-wing. And a lot of them say, we want Macron to do much more on the environment. Well, who like, knows like, what the Gilets Jaunes are Well, doing. you know, I mean, depends you know, where they yeah, are. They're completely But nuts. the ones in Paris are, are very much, you know, they're very much of the left now, uh, not of the right, like, like some of mm. them were. And it's a mix. Much, yeah, it's a mix. And it's, there are some cats there. And when they're there, burning but, cars, I don't think that's good for the environment. And they do a Lot but of that. I think the, the biggest problem <laughs> with the <laughs> environmental <laughs> movement is that obviously with the yellow vest you can claim things from your government and you you know you can obtain perhaps you know more money or less taxes or whatever. The problem with the environmental movement is that everybody sort of knows that no matter what my country does, it doesn't really matter if the neighboring country. No, I think or you have to start India. somewhere there. Oh, you have to of start course, no, of I'm, course, just, uh, I'm just trying to yeah. explain yeah, yeah, yeah. the mentality. No, and if, and and that's why everybody says they should do something. What about yeah. China? What yeah, about yeah, India? Yeah. What about yeah. the states? And of course, those protesters in London uh, got the visit of your compatriot, 16-year-old Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg, who's back home in Stockholm after an Easter break that saw the 16-year-old go from Stockholm to Strasbourg at the European Parliament, then to Rome to meet the Pope. And then she rallied with the Friday for Futures activists there, then up to London uh, before going uh, back home. And she did it all by train. We've learned a word in Swedish uh, over the last couple of weeks. Let me see if I pronounce this correctly, Flugscam. Johan. Flugscam. Yeah. Which right. means uh, flight, flight shame. Yeah, flight shame, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's becoming more and more common, I would say, in, you know, in some, at least some social groups in, in Sweden. Uh, you don't brag about going on a, you know, long-distance weekend anymore because it's actually, you know, your, your carbon footprint is closely surveyed by, by uh, your peers, I would say. So uh, it's, uh, there, there is also a huge trend of taking the train in Sweden this, this summer. The train tickets have, uh, the prices haven't risen, but the, the, the urge to, to go on you know, train holiday in Europe 
has become really, really, you know, a lot bigger. They haven't seen this in, in 30 years. In I think it shows yeah. people can change their behavior, and they do change their behavior. You know, if you go up to somebody who's got their car running and you tell them to turn the engine off, even if they object and say, you know, why should I turn it off? Um, I think it does make a difference, mm. you know. It's, right. So, it's like, you know, people people are changing their behavior. I, and I tell you, and, the, and big, the quicker it happens, the better. Big and, thing is, sorry, just influencers. You know, to take the, the you know right. what, who everybody's talking about right now that used to go on, you know, those holidays are now not posting this on social media yeah. anymore. <laughs> or to talk, or, or to, uh, to talk a little bit about what Chris Ridicky was mentioning earlier, tax perhaps kerosene instead of diesel. Uh, many thanks for that, uh, Chris Ridicky. I want to thank as well uh, Johanna Frenden, Sylvia Ayuso, and Victor Mout. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. <laughs> And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. So the reviews are in for Emmanuel Macron? <laughs> well, I don't know about the reviews exactly, but um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone's certainly talking about Emmanuel Macron. For some reason, my computer's frozen, so I'm hoping it will uh, kick back into life at some point. Uh, but yes, basically, uh, everyone is commenting on Emmanuel Macron's marathon performance on television last night. Uh, this is the opinion of uh, Shonu, the cartoonist. And you've got Emmanuel Macron holding a fire hose there with, of course, Notre Dame in the background, because this was something that was delayed by that fire at Notre Dame and he's saying so is it out and you can see the gilets jaunes protesters all smoking with anger uh, one suspects that the gilets jaunes protests are mm. not out uh, courtesy of that television performance by Emmanuel Macron yesterday um, this is another cartoon from Carac which says <laughs> clearly doesn't have much faith in uh, what Emmanuel Macron is proposing to do he says I promise to say fewer stupid things but I will keep doing them to you mm -hmm. so the words may mean one thing but the actions well Clearly, he doesn't expect right. much to change. Um, when you look at the newspapers, mixed reviews as well. Uh, Le Parisien going with uh, new priorities. That's one of the kinder ones, as is this from Le Figaro. Uh, he's sketching out the plan for his new ambition. Uh, less <laughs> polite from the Huffington Post. Effet plouf, which I think is wonderful. Basically yeah. means plonk, plop, it's been a flop. Right. Um, <laughs> Not meaning to, to rhyme that one. Um, Liberation has said, Where's where the is wow the effect? wow? <laughs> exactly. Um, because there really wasn't any sort of killer blow that was going to make everyone sit up and say, this could do it. This could quell the, all, the, all the discontent out there. Um, looking elsewhere as well, Lacroix um, says this, that the method changes, but not the direction. Mm. So, again, it's that idea that this is just words rather than actions in place. Um, looking elsewhere, if my mouse will work, very tricky today, uh, seven million people uh, watched this go out last night, uh, proving very popular indeed. If I could show it to you. Um, <laughs> but yes, a lot of people seem to be unconvinced. Looking at the polls, the polls are terrible. Mm. Uh, the best I've seen is that 67% are angry with what he said. The worst was well into 90%. So, uh, but the interesting thing is that at the same time, um, the Gilets Jaunes movement also doesn't have the majority of support. So it kind of seems you do wonder who's mm. supporting what. Um, now, the other interesting thing, if it'll work, and it probably won't, is that um, a lot of people spotted that Christophe Castaner um, actually uh, was sort of, well, appeared to be caught napping. The, the, the interior minister. The interior minister, yes. He said he's, he was challenged about it on France Info this morning and insisted that, no, he was very... Uh, interested and very attentive uh, throughout. However, he was photographed and it was shared widely online, him looking ah. really a little bored by the whole thing. OK. Well, that's a, an unflattering picture. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, another another story you're, you've been following for us is there's a new Instagram account in town. There is indeed, yes. The CIA has decided it wants to be among the influence, influencers. Right. Uh, they've already got over 30,000 followers. This was their first post. So far, their only post, it has to be said. Uh, and it says, I spy with my little eye. And you've got lots of things there, lots of clues, little hidden snippets of information. Um, you've got the original agency badge of the CIA director, Gina Haspel. Uh, you've got a notebook with the agency's motto, share what you can, protect what we must in Arabic. And that image in the middle, that gentleman there is Tony Mendez, the CIA officer who oversaw like the Sellers. 1979 rescue <laughs> of the uh, hostages in, in Iran. So oh, okay. lots of things there. And lots Recently of people... passed away. 
Yes, and lots of people really going to great efforts. I'm not sure whether they think they're going to be recruited directly from Instagram, but lots of people <laughs> making lots of efforts to do that. Whether it's quite as good as their original tweet, because they've been on Twitter for five years, I think the tweet wins it. We can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that this is our first tweet. All right. The CIA on Instagram. We'll have to think about that one. Uh, Emma James, many thanks. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week. What do you do if you discover their